Welcome back everyone. So today we are going to write the same parser as last time, except this time we're going to do it differently. Last time we saw how to write a simple parser for parsing expression grammar by hand. However, this parser has a lot of duplication. And this duplication comes from the fact that we're dealing with the same kind of expression again and again. Last time we dealt with a very simple grammar, the grammar for JSON. But if you go to a much bigger grammar, what will, what will happen is that re-implementing these patterns over and over will become very tedious. And also you risk making an error. So these expressions are things like uh, sequences, choices, repetitions, things like that. So the idea that we're going with here is that we're going to build an abstract syntax tree where each node is one such expression. And then we're going to interpret this tree. Don't worry if that seems a bit abstract right now, uh, you'll understand as we code it. So as I said, we're dealing with parsing expressions. So you can see that I've uh, delimited them in two big categories here. First, there's the lexical category. And uh, that's concerned with matching characters. Okay, so that's something we haven't dealt with so far, and we're still not going to deal with it today, um, because we're just assuming we receive tokens, which are characters that are already grouped in a coherent unit. Uh, you can see wherever, though, that in the grammar, we do kind of use uh, strings here to say, well, those are just simple characters, and uh, there's nothing to them. But normally, if you use the real peg approach, uh, then for these two things, which are also tokens, we should have implemented them using this character matcher and the syntactic matcher here. So regarding these uh, matcher, um, this should be fairly familiar. So there's the uh, option optional matcher, there's the zero or more, one or more. This one is actually not used in our grammar. There is sequences and there is repetition. These two right here, we haven't seen. Those are look ahead operators. Uh, we'll see them later. So we don't need to worry about them now. So I think that's it. Let's jump right into the code. So our setup is the same as last time. We see have our example, uh, our state is the input, the input position, and the stack to build the abstract, abstract syntax tree. We're still not dealing with the lexical layer, so I've kept our uh, lexing function. But here is the interesting stuff. So this is called the parser combinator approach. Okay. And basically, the idea is that each combinator is a node in the abstract syntax tree that I've been talking to you about. So each node is a parsing expression, if you want. And we're going to represent these uh, nodes by implementations of the, this interface. I've called it parser. I could have called it node or parsing combinator. It doesn't matter. The interface is similar to the parsing functions that we've been implementing before. So it just returns a Boolean and it has the same contract. So it should either succeed and update the input position past the thing that was matched, or it should fail, returning false, and not touch the input position. So it's going to be very simple to port the old ideas to these new paradigms. So since the lexical layer is to remain unchanged, I've already implemented a, this interface a couple of times for the token. So there's a string literal parser, which simply returns the function that we used before. Same thing for numbers. Right, which return numbers. Same thing for the character parser. Now, we need to do two things. We need to implement the interface a couple more times for each kind of expression that we're dealing with. So this, is, this will be done here. And then we actually need to build the rules of our parser um, to match what we've done before. So, uh, well, Let's start at the beginning. And, oh yes, something important I didn't mention. I've ordered these rules 
uh, differently from before. Because basically we are storing... So as I'm talking about rules by analogy to grammar rules, okay? So you see here we have the value rule, the object rule, etc. Um, and we are going to construct the AST and we're going to store them in variable, which are fields of the class. But there's a thing with uh, fields in Java is that you can only access uh, fields that have been declared before. So for instance, this is fine because pair has been declared before. But if I were to use object, which is declared there, then you can see I get some, some uh, error because it's a forward reference. So as much as possible, we should strive to um, order the fields by dependencies. It's not always possible, and we shall see how we deal with that. Basically, once you have recursion, it's, not, it's no longer possible to do that. So we are starting with pair, and pair is a very straightforward sequence of a string literal, a colon, and a value. So what we need here is a uh, combinator implementation for sequences. So we don't have it, but uh, when we have it, it's going to have a constructor like this. We already have the uh, string lit parser. We already have the, uh, it's called char parser. Yes, exactly. It's a colon and it should be there. And the value parser. Uh, so this is the, a case where we need a forward reference. So we're just going to put that to do there. But the first thing we need here is to implement this sequence thing. So let's do that here. Um, right. We want to implement parse. So what does the sequence do? It has some children parser and it calls them in a sequence. So let's deal with that. It should have some other parser it's called children. They should be passed to the constructor. Which is fine. We're going to use a variadic uh, parameter. So if you don't know, that just allows us to do new sequence and then pass it a bunch of uh, parser, as many as we want. And basically this thing is equivalent to an array. So we'll just stuff it into the array and, and pass it to us. Okay, once we have this, obviously we don't want to return false. Uh, we're going to, oh no, I don't, I don't like this. Right, this is better. So for each children, we are going to parse it, of course. Uh, what happens if it fails? Well, if it fails, we need to reset the input position. This is exactly the same logic as before that we're implementing. We're just doing it the hard way because we're not copy-pasting. So if it fails, we reset the input position and we return false. Otherwise, if everything succeeds at the end, we return true. Does that seem correct? Yes, it does seem correct to me. Um, okay, I will explain quickly how to implement forward references. So, okay, the issue here is we, that we want to write value, but we can't. Um, well, let me implement the solution, then I will explain it as I do so. Um, we're going to use something I called a lazy parser, or maybe I could call it, let's call it forward reference. Parser. All right. So the trick we're going to use is that 
um, we're going to use a a lambda function to pass it a function that will return the proper the proper field so it will be a supplier parser go to supplier and let's add a construct for it and when we parse it we just delegate to the to the returned parser okay so the, how does this does that look in practice new forward reference so it's a lamp okay so maybe i can show you the signature of supplier um i'll just go to definition so it's a simple functional interface which means that when we do a lambda it will act as though it's an implementation of this class which has a single method uh, takes no argument and returns a value like I, like it says it's a supplier so let's supply the lambda there's no parameters and what we want is a value like this so uh, we're forced to write this that value um this is a rule of the java language oh okay if we just write value it doesn't work i don't know why it's like that but it's like that but this that value this works well so the trick here is that when we're building the pair um ast the pair parser we don't need to know the value here okay we're just passing it a function and only when we run this thing will it call the function and get the value except the trick is when we actually call the parser well all of this will have been initialized okay so that's why this trick works because we say well later get it and at this later stage we already have built it okay now that we've done this uh let's do the next thing which is a repetition so we're going to build this uh this way so we need a repetition and this repetition will contain a sequence which will contain two elements uh Uma and a pair, which we just did before. So we just need to implement repetition here. Actually, actually, let's let this be. Let's be nice and pretty, and systematic. So we can see exactly what's going on the structure of the tree so uh, let me do some copy paste we want a parser that is called repetition uh, repetition only has one child uh, i'm using public or private for the fields here it doesn't really matter uh, if we're doing a real framework we'll talk we would think a bit about who needs to access what here it's just an example so whatever so there's a single child um why a single child well we can just pass it a sequence of that child so it doesn't really make sense to accept more than one and we want to implement this So remember that this is uh, zero or more repetition. So ultimately, it should always return true. And uh, it should just call the child repeatedly uh, while it's possible. So as long as it succeeds, keep invoca invoking it. And once it fails, just return true because we always succeed. Uh, why is it not happy? 
Yeah, right. This class is maybe static. Okay, let's do that. So that's good. That's already done. Um, so here we need a new kind of parser, which is the optional parser. Or the optional parser takes a sequential parser. Uh, first item is a pair. Second item is a repetition, which takes a sequence, which takes a uh, Character and a pair. Right. Does this looks right? Optional sequence pair repetition with a sequence. Yep, it does look right. So optional. Also a single children, so we can just copy the whole thing. Um, optional also always succeeds, so we just invoke the child, the child, sorry, and we return true. We didn't change the name here. Okay. We're making good progress. So, do we actually need anything new here? No, it doesn't look like it. We have everything we need. So now it's going to go real fast. Race. Oh, I'm being stupid. Um, yes, I'm be I was also thinking this is very verbose. Uh, I did this for the first time like one or two weeks ago, so it's not so fresh in my mind. Uh, see this? Fairy tale is supposed to be this, which is exactly the part that we have there. So this whole thing here is the same as this whole thing here. So we don't need all of that, we just need pair tails. And similarly here, this whole thing here, that just pairs, so... We do it like that. And we're done with this one. That was easy. Um, so I don't know if you remember last time, but basically the values were always sort of similar as the pairs. So this is very similar to this. Uh, we only change the... Yes, my... My default indentation is not perfect. And this should be a value. So, this is actually quite interesting. Uh, yeah, and uh, of course, value we need a, a forward reference. Same thing as before. So, I think this is interesting because you see the pattern here um, is the same as there. So we could, if we wanted, introduce a new combinator for that specific pattern. Here it's a bit overkill, but in a big grammar, it might be worth thinking about it. It also depends on the parsing tool that you use, if it lets you define new combinators or not. Um, so 
in the project, you're going to use Auton. That's a tool that I wrote. And in Auton, you can define new combinators. But there's a big library of uh, built-in combinators. So normally, you won't have two. Uh, I would be surprised if you really have two, but uh, it's possible if you need to. Uh, and, and one thing we have in Auton, um, next time, I will actually show you uh, the same parser we did here in Atom. So we, it will be interesting to see how a real tool is a bit different uh, to the approach we've been following here. But in Atom, you actually have a uh, combinator for comma-separated values. So instead of writing this whole, this whole mess here, you're just able to write um, something that says, well, I want a value uh, zero or more and separated by commas. I will just automatically do all the wiring for you. Anyhow, this is not indented correctly. This is good. So values is again similar to pairs. Uh, maybe if we copy the whole thing, it will keep the indentation. Let's see. No. Except we want a value. Well, we want this. And we want value tails. And Array is going to be similar to object. Array uh, values. And we get to the last one already, and it's going to be a choice. So we haven't implemented that one yet. Check. Array. Yes, it's not happy because choice doesn't exist. So choice is actually somewhat similar. Oh, 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 you see this? This is a problem. Uh, because pos is a field in the uh, big class, OK? Uh, this, in this version, it's called combinators, but whatever. And because we made this a static class, it can't access the, the field of the outer class. So this cannot be static. Um, but the other one can. Yes, OK. So the choice is a bit like the sequence, in that it also has a bunch of children. but it does handle them differently. Uh, in that we don't need to store the position, so this can actually be static. And basically, the difference is that when there is a child that matches, the first one that matches succeeds. So as soon as a child succeeds, we just return true. Um, and if none of them succeed, we return false. Okay. Um, that does seem correct. Time to try it out.
Okay. It does seem to work. We haven't built a parse tree yet. So the lexical function do build a parse tree. Uh, they're the same as before. But in the AST version, we haven't built a parse tree. Normally, your parsing tool would give you some support for that. Um, this is a bit more complicated. So we're just going to build combinators that uh, do these things for us. And so remember that every node in our abstract syntax tree, so the, the JSON abstract syntax tree, is going to be a literal, a string literal, a number. We already have um, nodes built for those, so strings or just numbers. Uh, what we need to build is a map for the object a, and a, an array for the array, an array list. So the way I want to do this is basically wrap the whole object in a new, a new combinator called compose object, which will take this as a child. And for the array, I will do the same thing. Compose array. So this will need to access the stack, so it cannot be stat Ooh. it cannot be static. So the first thing this thing does is um run the child. If the child does not succeed, we don't need to push a, a node on the AST, right? So says if we don't succeed, immediately return false. Otherwise we are return true. I can type. Now we need to uh, build the parser. So here we are sure that we succeeded. So if you remember how it worked, um, so objects are sequences of pairs and each pair is a string key and a value, uh, a value value. So it could be anything. And these are pushed on the stack. So on the top, you will have a value. Then you have the key that corresponds to that and another uh, value and another key, etc. So we should write that in a while loop. Um, and remember that we also need to um, record the position in the stack to know until where we need to go. Um, object value. Uh, and so what we want to build is a hash map. Okay. That should do it. I don't think we missed anything there. So this is just exactly the same as, as the initial lecture where we build the parser by hand. And then we need to do this for the compose array. So see that this, basically you can still run any code that you want, just like we did before, except now this code is going to be stuffed into uh, this implementation of the parser interface. And you're going to write the actual rules in terms of these parsers. 
Uh, the advantage is that it's reusable. Once you have the class, you can instantiate it many times. Okay, compose array. We also need the stack size. Uh, the same thing. We're not building a map. We're building an array list of objects. Uh, and we're only popping uh, a value. We're just actually doing a bit of add spider pop. But uh, remember that it's a stack, so it's last in first out, so we need to reverse the array. Uh, it's still called object, let's re rename it to array. And that's it, we just uh, pop everything from the stack, put it in the array, reverse it, push the array. Okay, okay, okay. Um, let's give this a try. It did succeed. Um, and let's look at the stack. There's indeed hash map with the right version and the bundle map seems to be okay um, let's just look at uh, the order so yeah we have the installer first and the os bundle so the order is correct okay we've done it i hope you saw that uh this approach is not fundamentally harder than the manual one once you know what to do. And of course, you only need to write these uh, combinator classes once. Afterwards, you can reuse them. And let's be honest, this is much more readable than whatever we had last time. This immediately, you read this, you know, you know what's up. You know, okay, a sequence, there's a character, there's some values. This. There's a very direct mapping with the grammar we have here. So this is uh, pretty advantageous in general. Okay, that's it. Um, we'll go back to the slides and uh, say a little conclusion, and that will be it for this video. Okay, so what have we learned? We can use Parser Combinator to cut down verbosity and code duplication. And a lot of these combinators are not specific to a single grammar. So we implemented choice, we implemented sequences, repetition, optionality. All of those are needed pretty much in every single grammar. So you do it once and then it's done for every grammar. Well, typically the, the author of the parsing library does it for you. But you can also build your own uh, combinators for your own grammar. So if you have a pattern that uh, recurs often, then you can write a combinator for it and then just use it. Uh, I gave you, for instance, the example of uh, comma-separated values. Imagine the, the library that you use does not have that. Well, you can write it yourself if you want. Uh, this pattern does have a couple downsides, which the, are important to mention. It, it's a bit harder to debug because basically, because we've extracted the duplications in the code, it means that, for instance, every single sequence is going to go through the same sequence logic. So if you put a debug point there, you won't know which sequence you are in the grammar. Whereas before you could know, oh, I'm in the sequence that is used in that particular uh, grammar rule. That being said, normally a tool will supply you with possibilities to help you. That's definitely the case of my tool. And also debugging, debugging is something the author of a parser does but the end user uh, does not need to worry with debugging. Uh, these parser are actually slower than the first one we built because of uh, something called megamorphism. So this is something we'll talk about when we talk about optimization. But since we have uh, such a perfect example of it here, I thought I should mention it so I can 
remind it to you later. Uh, basically, what this megamorphism is, is that we have the parser interface, and uh, every time we're calling a parse function, we're calling it through the interface. We just know that the thing is a parser. And that means that it's very hard for the, compila uh, the compiler to optimize through that function because it never knows what you're calling. There's like 10 in this case, but maybe for a real tool, there's going to be 20, 50 implementation of the parser interface, and you never know which one you're going to. So inlining is out of the picture, and you will remind that inlining is uh, really one crucial optimization. You can actually eliminate this issue if you generate code. So what we could do is write the code like we did this time, but then interpret the AST to generate the code that we wrote last time. Okay, so that, that's also a possibility. And then you kind of get the best of both worlds because it's more easily debuggable and it's much more performant. Next time we will see the JSON parser again but this time it will be written in Atten, which is the framework that I wrote and that you will use to write the grammar of your very own programming language for the project. See you next time.